Yes, ma'am, not my cup of tea. Uh, I'm only trained at the very, very basic level. Essentially, what you guys are going to be trained at, that's what I'm trained at, is recognition. Okay? I recognize that there's a hazmat situation, then I get out of the way. <laughs> uh, I don't want any part of hazardous training or uh, decontamination. I'm very comfortable sitting in the code zone and picking up patients that are already cleaned off and taking them to the hospital. Uh, I don't want my face to melt off. I know it's not very attractive to begin with, but with my skin sloughing off my face from some sort of weird chemical, I don't want that to happen, right? So there's a lot of bad, bad chemicals out there. So our, uh, we, could, we could really make this really quick, uh, but you need more information. Your basic job in a hazmat situation is patient transport, patient care, right? There's specialized training to do the decontamination and everything else. So you're to keep yourself safe above all and transport decontaminated patients to the right facilities. That's it. All right? Leave everything else to the hazmat guys that have the specialized training. Don't try to get and do things that you shouldn't be doing that you're not trained to do, right? Any questions? Good, good class, good talk. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> that's pretty much it. Uh, however, we'll, we'll take the long route. Anyway, a uh, lot of hatch 635, right? Hazardous materials going on 635 all the time, every day, seven days a week. <laughs> You'll see them out there. We'll look at this, the placard system in just a second. But you'll see the placard, so you'll know that there's a hazardous ma material on that. Some are really bad. Some are just like gasoline has a placard on it, right? Uh, oxygen has a placard on it. The, uh, so, in unless you have the book, you drive behind them or Google, see what the placard is. You won't know what they're they're transporting. Okay, but very dangerous. So, uh, explosives, corrosives radioactive material, different things. So, but as an EMT, you just have to recognize, hey, this is a hazmat situation. Okay, so I'm going to call, I'm going to back away and we're going to call a hazmat team for them to come out and more evaluate the system and evacuate patients, potential patients that we may, that we may have, okay? Don't get caught up in TV drama, okay? of driving your ambulance right up to this turned over vehicle. I think there's a picture. Yeah. Don't, you know, get caught up in Chicago Fire or whatever and you drive your vehicle right up here without knowing what that is, okay? There's things out there that leaks out of uh, tankers, like chlorine gas, has sort of a green cloud to it, that uh, the death is in, uh, it's fatal at parts per billion, I believe. Okay. So you'll notice that you'll, you'll see people laying upside on the side of it because they're already dead. And then if you go into that situation, one breath, and guess what you are? Uh, you're dead. Okay. Then the smart people are way back there going, we better clear this off, right? We're going to do something differently. So uh, that's an extreme case. The not so extreme case. This liquid right here, it's a good picture to talk about for a few minutes. This liquid right here, we, now obviously they've already cleared it or something, There's, they're standing there, okay? So whatever it is can't be sort of airborne, toxic, but uh, you walk through a liquid and all of a sudden you break down and you start foaming out the mouth and having life-threatening seizures. Because what was on the ground that looked like water was not water. It may have been like an organic phosphate. So now you have organic phosphate poisoning. So <laughs> be very cautious around these things. Uh, in realistically, if you guys not primarily going into EMS, you, you may not ever experience that. But if you're driving down the road and you see that, get off. <laughs> get off the road. Get get away from it. Okay. Uh, they do pose a threat to life or, or health, okay? You can breathe in certain gases that would affect you the rest of your life, 
the, your respiratory system the rest of your life with, with one inhalation, okay? We just don't know what, uh, if, if you just don't know what it is, okay? Some of it may react, some of it may react with water, okay? So you, you have to be aware of what all these different chemicals are. Not, not to, you don't keep that stuff in your head. It's all wrote down in a book somewhere, okay? And realistically, somebody else is looking that up for you. So you arrive on scene, you say, hey, I think we have a hazardous material uh, scene here. You back away, get at your safe distance, and you look through the binos with, uh, for the placard, and you tell dispatch what the placard says, and they're, they're typing in the information like crazy and looking it up. As, an, as a provider, healthcare provider, you really don't have time to do all that. That's why you need someone else to do it. Because you're trying to figure out, one, where to go to get safe, be safe, and two, look at patients and patient count, okay? So you're a little busy to be flipping through a book or on your computer trying to, or, or calling someone, trying to find out information on what that material is, right? So anyway, you have people that's going to help, help you out with that. Uh, I think that's supposed to spell something. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe. Huh? Chainsaw. Okay. Anyway, thermal, things that burn, right? Radiological, nuclear. <laughs> Definitely don't want to be around in a nuclear problem, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, and you end up without any hair. So, uh, uh, asphyxiation. Whatever it is, whatever the chemical is, is taking away the oxygen that's in the air, okay? So you're not able to breathe, okay? It could be most of the time you're going to look at chemical. You never, ever, ever want to be around a biological agent. We have one more class, and we'll talk about MCIs and biological agents and, and these different things. Actually, two, two classes, okay? And then other things that poses a, a threat. But I guess that's sort of way that you can uh, helps you memorize the different types of threat. Every card out, I mean, every truck out there has to have the shipping papers along with it. So the truck driver has the. Uh, it, it requires specialized training to drive hazardous materials around. So every truck driver has these shipping papers with them and plus their truck is labeled with a placard and these are the different placards that you look at and they they have a picture these are hard to see but you see the little flame there <clears throat> so that means flammable right? uh, explosive radioactive they have the they have the placard they have a universal picture that everybody recognizes right uh, and then they have it wrote down with a number on it. Now all these are single digit numbers, but uh, some of them are three or four digit numbers. Anyway, you have a book. The DOT comes out with it. You can look this up in a book. But more than likely, what's going to take place with these placards is you're going to see your wreck truck or, or whatever it might be with a placard on it, and you're say, uh, I have a, you know, a number, uh, Piper 127, and dispatch will go, hang on just a second, stand by, and they're typing their computer, they'll look at that placard, uh, 127, and it tells you what it is. And then from there, you're set up a perimeter for this hazardous material based on the information that you get out of this book. You may get it from another company. Uh, Kim, him to track or something uh, of that nature, you get it from them, and then you're able to establish the hazardous material scene, okay, and there's a few steps that will go in, but your your case is to recognize it and, and set this up and make sure that nobody walks into it, okay, uh, and that you don't, you don't go into it. You'll see bystanders all the time, we'll be back, we'll park way back from this truck, and we'll try and get everybody out 
people who jump out of their cars because they want to be heroes and they run body into the hazmat scene. And uh, you're only foolish if you run in after them. Uh, you, me, I just sit back going, you don't do that, don't do that. <laughs> Get on my air thing, just stop, stop, don't go in there. And they keep running because they, they want to be heroes, okay? And depending on what it is, they may take their last breath doing that. So you have to be very careful. So you, so you look at this, and we'll go into these different zones here in just a minute. But there's that placard. I think you can probably now ask Google. You could probably get on Google and say, Hey Google, what's placard, red placard 1, 1866 mean? Try that. Is that I, don't know, I don't know if it'll work or not, but Google knows everything. Right? Uh, Siri? Siri doesn't. Siri's so hard. Yeah, that's insane. Google. Oh, really? Try it. Hey Siri. Uh, what does a red placard with 1866 mean? Okay. I said red. I found something. What'd she say? You cut her off. I know. I said it didn't say placard. It said red black. She oh. thought I said red black. Oh. Yeah. Say hey Siri. Hey Siri. Hey Siri. Placard 1866. You were saying no. Placard eighteen sixty six. See, you need Google. Google's like boom. You don't have Google? I have Google. It says it's resin solution. Okay. So it did it come up? If you say vinyl. Huh? If you say vinyl. Okay. So it's like a glue or something. Yeah. Okay. So it's not gonna kill you. It's not gonna smell good, but it's not gonna kill you. Okay, but you can speak into it, type it in your phone right quick. So you, you know pretty quick with modern the technology. There's probably an app out there that will, will, will do this as well, okay? But if all else fails and you don't have time to do that, then uh, notify your dispatch and they'll look it up. You have different placards like this, okay? So uh, you just want to make sure that you're aware of what's... Uh, in there, and then you have the MSDS material safety data sheet. It actually doesn't come in sheets anymore; it's all online. And then you can it will pull that up and uh, and tells it tells you what it is. Is it corrosive? Is it is it a respiratory problem? You know, whatever it takes. But again, <clears throat> once you identify it, it's still not your spot to go in there and. And try to do the rescue. Okay, so uh, some clues that you look at, you're you're pulling up, you're doing your good size up. If the if it's smoky, you see the placard, so you've already identified it as a may, potential hazmat. Okay, you see it smoking, stay away. Right? Okay, uh, some fire condition. You see it being spit out of the tanker you know, bubbling on the ground, hey, stay away from it, right? You, you don't know what it is. Colored vapors, like we talked about, they always go in and talk about chlorine gas because it's the killer of everybody, okay? And it, it's transported on a train, trucks, okay? We have railroad tracks running through this side of the city over here. It wouldn't surprise me if, it's, if it goes right through town, okay? Chlorine gas is, is is deadly, and so it's you can't smell it, but they put a green tint to it so you can see it, and uh, you see green gas. Stay away. Okay. It could be the trucker and the bad burrito, or it could be chlorine gas. Huh? Uh, uh, get it, trucker, bad burrito. Uh, uh, uh. Anyway. Uh, Frost, so things are freezing. Anything that's unusual, look at that. Make sure that you stay away. Uh, confined space entry, it's a specialized training as well. And uh, <clears throat> it's spooky. I've, I've done that, and I don't like it. Uh, you get all in these tubes and, and everything. And 
sort of tricky, but uh, so this is telling you that that it takes this tank is a confined space, so you wouldn't go in there unless you were trained hazmat in confined space trained. It takes specialized training. Different storage tanks is this is the same way, you know. Be cautious of of where you go into. My first EMS job was at a copper refinery, and people out there, they made good, a good living that worked there, and, uh, but when they got ready to retire, most of them died from cancer of some sort, because all the pollutants that on, was on this place. So there was one place that if we went into it, uh, we would, at a minimum, have to wear a respirator. You couldn't go in the door without putting on a respirator. But if we went so far into it, which wasn't very far, when we came out, we had to take all of our clothes, we had to shower, and put on new clothes before we could return to work. So if we had a patient in there, we would, no matter the condition of the patient, they could be in cardiac arrest, we would have to pull the patient out, strip them down, strip us down, I guess I'll take a shower together. He's dead, they won't, he wouldn't mind, right? Decontaminate, redress, at least us, right? And then go to the hospital. Otherwise, we're transporting this patient that's contaminated. We couldn't do it. It was a nightmare. And so the, uh, to, to do, uh, even in training, it was a pain. But you, you absolutely, everything on you was carcinogenic, so you couldn't, you couldn't do anything, you had to, to wash. Every employee that went in there, that worked in that space, had to come in in civilian attire. They walked, they took a shower, they dressed into their work uniform. When it was time for them to get off, they took the work uniform off in a con uh, controlled space, put it to, be, to do the laundry, and then they had to shower before they went home. If they didn't do that system, they would instantly terminate it. They got caught doing shortcuts. So anyway, so you have to be sort of careful as you, as you go in. But like you're saying, dispatch is going to help you. You're going to need help from dispatch. It's just like this U.S. That's the Department of Transportation. This emergency response guide, it's a small book, it has all the placards and the names and everything. Kim, Kim Track is another organization, but dispatch will be calling them. The, this says, and probably your book says, if you have to call them, you don't have time to call them. Let somebody else that's sitting in a cubicle call them and, and get the information for you, okay? Uh, anyway, so that's, that's, that's part of the training there. Uh, and this this is why it says if, if you have to call like uh, was it Kim Trek or, or whatever and you need to leave them a message and, and do all this other stuff and eh, you're not going to do all that uh, let the dispatcher do it or the supervisor do it or whoever is available that's in that response team do that uh, you're just not going to have time to do it because you're, you're trying to get somewhere safe and, and keep other people out of the, the hazmat area. Okay. These are things that you're going to have to provide. Now, while you're sitting there, you need to provide, you know, what size of container, what's the weather conditions there. Don't worry, they already know it. A good dispatcher is going to pull that up. I've had it happen. They're going to pull that up, tell you which way the wind is blowing, uh, what the temperature is. If you're if you're safe from where you're at, depending on the, the wind and everything else. So, uh, if there's any injuries, if you see visible people there, okay, and then uh, they'll they're tell you to stay back from it until we can identify it. We spent all night on Interstate 30. We shut the entire interstate down uh, going towards Sulphur Springs, just past Greenville both sides. You couldn't get into Greenville that way, and you couldn't go to like Texarkana the other way. We had both sides shut down 
we initially shut, shut down both service roads because of the, this zone that we wanted to protect people out of. And so nobody got through unless they started rerouting them way down the road to, to go completely around uh, the area. And it lasted all night long. A hazmat team had to come out. The guy from Fort Worth had to come out and, and evaluate the scene. Okay, so uh, we had it was fertilizer mixed with diesel fuel was the problem. You guys are probably too young to remember the Oklahoma City bombing, but that guy who blew up the, local, uh, the federal building in Oklahoma City. He used diesel fuel and uh, fertilizer. He set off a bomb that almost took down that entire building. So that's what was mixed together on the side of the road. We were a long way back from it. We just kept backing up and backing up from it until, until the hazmat team got out there. So anyway, it does, these take a long time. All right. So you're required to have uh, training, hazardous material training. Okay. So this first responder awareness is where we are. You're aware of this. Okay. And and this is what you get. If you started working in EMS, then you would get a little bit more training in this and practice and drills and different things. But this is usually where we are right here. You have operations thing. And all these, all this means is, this is just more training, okay? So this might be a, a 48 hour class, and I don't know, I'm just spitting it out there, right? Hypothetically, this might be a 48 hour training, this might be a week long training, this might be a month long training, whatever to get down in here. These guys down in here are the ones that with the, the yellow suits on, with the big mask, the gloves that's all taped up, you've seen it, right? At least on TV. That's these guys here. They can do all that they want. I'll very happily stay back in my ambulance and wait for the patients. All right, so, uh, anyway, so it does take specialized training. Never attempt to rescue, okay, somebody. If, if you're sitting back there off the road and you're looking with your binos and the truck is turned off and the guy is his skin is melting off his face and he's saying come on help me help me help me right up here he goes ah, it sucks to be you <laughs> you know because I'm not going down there I mean the person's just going to die and then what are you going to do at the end of your shift Go home. You're going to go home, hug your family. But if you go down there, you're not going home. It's, it's pretty simple. Okay? So be very cautious with that. Uh, your job, one of your, one of your goals in your job is to go home at the end of the shift. If you get involved in this stuff, trying to play hero, you won't go home at the end of your shift. Uh, or you'll end up with some sort of debilitating problem perhaps okay or th or there's always the option that nothing can happen to you but do you want to play that game of roulette I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't do it okay let let people who are trained to do that they're trained to get their special toys on and then they they go do it okay avoid risking your life and your health at, at all costs, okay? The reason that we're so harsh about that is that that person I just described is probably going to die anyway. You just don't want to join him in, a, in his trip to death, okay? Because they're, they're probably going to die. So just just think about that. You do what you're trained to do. It's, it's where it comes in sort of the bottom line. So recognize, right? Avoid rain. Yeah. Recognize, avoid contact. Right? Isolate the area. Very important. Notify the authorities 
in the different response agencies. Okay, once you notify dispatch, and usually uh, the like the EMS supervisor or the chief or the EMS chief, depending, then they will take over and they will start notifying different people. Uh, it's a big chain of event that will will put the second part of this sort of in play uh, next class when we talk about MCIs. So recognize, avoid, isolate, and, and notify, okay? Unless you're trained, okay? Uh, you're not expected to take part of the decontamination procedures. Matter of fact, most of the time, they rather you stay back because you're not trained to do things, right? You know, uh, years ago, I, I, like I can't build a, a square box. Right? I mean, you can't build anything, okay? Years ago, uh, my father-in-law would be building something for us. He would build anything. He'd be building something for me. And, uh, you know, I wanted to help out, right? And he never said it because he was too nice of a person. But more than likely, he was thinking, just, just stay back. <laughs> just stay back there. I got, I got this. Stay back there. I don't need any help. Because <laughs> you're going to break something is probably what he was thinking. And he would have been correct. Okay, so stay back. Let the people do. Like on a rescue, and we talk about extrication, let them do that. That's what they're trained to do. Okay. Anyway, they they do pre-planned drilling, pre I mean pre-incident planning every year. You hear about it. They have a big MCI drill or hazmat drill. The cities, uh, the emergency planner. For the cities, they come up with all this. They plan these things out. It's a huge thing. Mesquite has one every year. Uh, Dallas has one. Every city has one of these every year where they plan these things out. They execute sort of a mock type hazmat thing. They, the ambulances come in. The helicopters come in. I participated in numbers of them. All right. Quite a few of them. And then... Uh, then they go back and they study things to see sort of how it went, lessons learned, and then they improve their plan. It's the way that that works. The big thing about this is you have one person in charge. You have to have that. One person is in charge, okay? And then everybody else follows that chain of command, okay, and a good communication system. If you want to cluster a total mess, okay, and we'll get more into this in, when we talk about MCIs, but if you want a mess, it's going to start with nobody being in charge, okay? Someone has to be in charge of it. And then everybody has to go through their chain of command and then do what their job is. We only want you to do what your job is in situations like this. So our job would be to pick up and transport decontaminated patients to the hospital. Okay, that's it. Uh, so that's that's hugely important uh, to establish the command sy system as it's set up. Okay, and because it works, it works very well when there's one person in charge and everybody knows what they're doing and they do their tasks. They don't try to do other people's jobs, right? You know how that goes. I mean, just in life, right? Somebody trying to do other people's jobs. Oh, thanks. Didn't think it would stay up. But, uh, so these guys here are going to start coming up with, with these different, different tasks. The problem is what it is, it, weather conditions, different things, okay? Definitely de need the wind direction, okay? Establish safety zones. Uh, time is very important. Number, uh, is, is there a danger there? Is there not a danger? Okay. And these safety zones, I think it's coming up. Yeah. We have three safety zones. And they're sort of marked out like this. If you have the, let me draw. 
That's like a big truck. It's on fire. Oh. Okay. So let's say we have X gas coming out from this truck. We've identified it. We look at the placard and says, oh, that's X gas. Ooh, bad. Right? So we're going to get the information from dispatch or information from our uh, DOT book, right? And it's going to say, establish these zones. So this is the hot zone. So, and whatever dimension that is, okay? I mean, it could be really big, okay, where you're evacuating or other people, police and fire are evacuating houses, right? You heard about that on the news, right? They're going to evacuate. They're going to evacuate these houses. So who knows how much, how big this is. It's just a certain size, okay? This is the hot zone. Right, let me draw the guy down here. And then you have one bystander run in there and try to help, and now they're down too. Okay? Oh, it was a team. Here's the other guy. He's a little bigger, but he's down too. So now you have three. Okay? Down in there in the hot zone. This is where this guy with the specialized equipment, where they have some pictures here in a second with the. They're, they're all geared up and they're gearing up and they know what this is and they're, they're going in with their suits on, right? So they go into the hot zone. Then you have a warm zone. Make sure I'm trying to get this right. And so you have this warm zone where the decontamination. So this is where the guys are sitting up the little baby swimming pools at. Most of the time what they do is they get these little plastic swimming pools and they fill them full of the, the chemicals. Picture this on a day like today when the wind's sort of chilly. But the, uh, they fill them up with the, the stuff that don't decontaminate the patient with the, what would you call that? The solvent, right? They don't, the stuff they're putting in there is gonna take off the, content, the X gas, it's gonna take it off. So they take these guys, the guys in the suits come in, and they pick up these guys and bring them over to these guys here to decontaminate. So they strip them down. If they can stand, they stand in that little pool, and they have these long brushes, and they do this like they're washing a car, and they're scrubbed down. Lift up your arm. Yeah, there we go. Right? And they're scrubbing down. And decontaminating them, they take, they get out of that pool. One time we did this, it was freezing cold outside almost. I mean, it was so cold. They had a bunch of high school kids out there in swimming suits, and <laughs> but they were washing them down. And so they get out of this pool, they go into the next little kiddie pool where they get rinsed off. Okay, and then they go into the next pool, they rinse again and then they're given a blanket to dry off with, right? Okay, because as they progress through the warm zone, and then there's the cold zone, and this is us. This is where your ambulance is, okay? So, if you have a patient, if you have a person coming out of the warm zone in clothes, what would you do? Send them back. Yeah, huh? Send them, send them back. Send them back. Stop. Hang on. Hang on. They're not decontaminated. Go back. Decontaminate. If they keep walking into your code zone, then you have to move it back. You have to move your code zone back. You have to start moving back. So you get them to stop. They stop. If you go over there and make contact with them, you might as well go into the warm zone with them. Because now you need to be decontaminated. Okay? But, so if they come out with clothes on, out of the warm zone, then you send them back. They should have a blanket on. Then you, then you, and they have the blanket, then you go up there, especially if it's cold, trying to get warming measures, warm them up, get them on the cot, look for signs and symptoms, treat signs and symptoms always, okay? 
There's a gazillion of them that we don't go into this part, okay? And then transport them, okay? We'll pick this up again when we talk about MCIs and different ways to get in and out, okay? But you have these three zones. Very important, because we're here. You cannot transport a contaminated patient. It doesn't matter if they're in cardiac arrest or not. You cannot transport them. They have to be decontaminated. If, if you do, you pick them up, now you're contaminated, your ambulance is contaminated, and this happened almost one time, they caught it just right before they got into Parkland with the contaminated patient, but if you go into the ER, the whole ER is now contaminated. Right? They caught this patient right before they uh, brought him in, and they decontaminated him on the outside, on the, on the porch, essentially, the apron. They have a, Parkland has a decon area out there where they, they caught them before they got to the ER. It would have been a mess if they would have gotten to the emergency department. Okay. But the whole ambulance and crew had to be decontaminated. Okay? So, uh, oh, there's a picture. Okay. Mine's better, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. Anyway, we, we could do this. You can set up triage, that's a, a topic for another day. S stabilize, do these different things. You can't read this, neither can I. The print's so small, but I'm sure that's in your book. So, you know, be familiar with it, sort of look over it. I don't think it's that uh, important. And this, this is just what we, this is just what we talked about, okay? Uh, if you're exposed, be ready to give up your clothes, okay? Uh, your, your equipment, now your ambulance is down, okay? And this really affects, like in an MCI, a mass casualty incident that we'll talk about next class, all of a sudden you decontaminate your, in, uh, your ambulance and now you're one unit down for transporting patients. It's, it's a big deal. Okay. You make somebody mad. And, and here's the guys in the special suits. Okay, different levels of, uh, of training. And then, of course, they're going to, like this guy, they're going to decontaminate his suit. But, uh, so he doesn't, but if this was a patient, if this was one of these guys, they'd be standing under this the same way being decontaminated. Uh, Modesty goes out the window when your when your skin's burning off, right? So you want that stuff off of you. The, the, this goes into a lot of different things with radiation exposure. I'm not really sure why. Radiation exposure is always bad. All right. So when when we talk about weapons of mass destruction, this is sort of what they're speaking of. Okay. Uh, this all came in few years back okay but the exposure they can you can be exposed to an agent whether it's radiation or other agents uh, through the air air deployment without even touching you okay you breathe it in you get it on your your skin and your clothes uh, yeah direct contact you're definitely contaminated so what this is saying is if it's air deployed then you're contaminated you have an exposure, okay? If they have direct contact, then you're contaminated, all right? Or, and that includes your clo clothing. Right? If you have a radioactive material on your clothes, you, you have to give those up. And then uh, your guidelines for that, protect yourself. Don't try to decontaminate the, the, the radioactivity. You don't know what it is. So you have this radiation safety officer in some systems, some you don't, but uh, you wouldn't try to decontaminate the patient. You just protect yourself and others from contamination. And then uh, this is sort of weird because not all ambulances come with a body bag, you know, but uh, it, it's telling you if the patient, if this radiation safety officer can't make it out, then you would zip the patient up to their head in a body bag. Right? This is probably something you would have to ask for. Uh, 
the different ambulance services I've worked for in different places, we've never carried body bags. That's a different person that comes out, okay, to do that. So this might take some logistical training, some time to get to get one of these, and then just wipe their face off, cover, come up with a towel or something, okay? Read, read through that, okay? But your priority in that, in any of these things, is your safety. You know, if you think that your patient's been nuked or something, I mean, they got radioactive material, sort of glowing green type thing, according to TV, right? Uh, then you want to stay away from them at, at a distance, okay? Until you can figure out what, what's taking place. If there's a symbol, let's say the truck rolled over with the radiation symbol on it, it it's the same way. Be alert of it, park way off, Try to figure out what it is. Call dispatch to get your hot code zones. And, uh, you know, they, they say go up in this self-contained breathing apparatus, or SCBA. That's what the fire department wears with the mask. You, you've seen it before. And in the pictures, you just can't see the... They have an SCBA on this guy does here with the mask. Okay, The tank's probably underneath this yellow suit. Anyway, uh, you don't carry those typically on an ambulance, uh, SCBA. So that's just something the fire department has like on the engines. It's typically an SCBA is what they would go into a structured fire with. So you don't put the mask on and go into a fire. That way they can breathe air, not oxygen, but air as they go into the fire. They're breathing air here. So uh, not something that is really found on an ambulance unless you work with the fire department. Okay. Sickness, it just goes in. Large amount of exposure. Hours, weeks and hours. Okay. What we would try to figure out is why, but look at the nausea, vomiting, hemorrhage, loss of appetite, fever. That's, besides the hemorrhage, you scratch that out in this part down here, that sounds like the flu, right? So a lot of times these are hard to detect uh, on there. This wouldn't be hair loss, burns, skin lesions. You'd be going, hey, what, what in the world is that? What, what have you been doing? What have you been around, right? You know, so the, uh, and then the poisoning. Problems from cancer, uh, like uh, chemo, perhaps chemo overdose. So no matter what it is, we, we would treat signs and symptoms. Treat signs and symptoms. Okay? If if your protection from a from a radioactive material and uh, we'll we'll look at this a little bit closer I think with that weapons of mass destruction type of shielding. So if there's a nuclear device out there, it's usually lead. So no matter what kind of, like a gamma ray, there's several different types of rays, but, and you wouldn't know necessarily what it was anyway, perhaps, but you would need to be behind a lead uh, or a wall at a minimal. It's like, a lot like uh, x-ray in the, in the hospital. They, everybody that's still in childbearing years will leave the room so they don't have that exposure and then the x-ray tech, he, has that, he or she has that long thing and she try to get out around the room too and push the x-ray. So they have a clip here that measures the amount of uh, exposure that they, they come in contact with. So uh, they have a monitor system there. But you may not know this, okay, but typically radioactive lead, I actually think that's the test question. You would have to be behind a lead barrier or something, okay? The other things that you do for hazardous material, and these are very common, by the way, especially the top one, meth labs. Uh, you heard uh, Breaking Bad, right? Boom. <laughs> so uh, you get these meth labs. We're, I work in EMS in an area where it was the meth capital of the world. And... Uh, we had trailer homes explode and we knew exactly what it was. It's a meth lab. They blew up. They had these these gases that don't mix in there and poof. 
I've been in the houses before where they've been making meth and you can hardly breathe. And you have to sort of get out. I was, I was probably only in the house about 10 minutes and I was, I was just completely nauseated. I couldn't breathe. And then I, I told the police and they were like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. And because you, you can smell these different things, okay? Uh, this... How, you, how would you, phosphine? Yeah. Odor of garlic or this decaying fish? Mmm, it's real, real strong garlic, maybe. I mean, it's a strong smell, okay? That you, look, it just takes your breath away. Anyhow, those things are like playing with gasoline and matches. I mean, they're just, they're just waiting to explode. Because the people who are cooking the meth are typically not the smartest bears in the woods, right? Yeah. And so they may be really smart in chemistry being able to make meth. But Well okay. Uh anyhow they go boom. So be careful with that. Uh you have marijuana labs, okay? And not not so much as a hazardous material, but uh, I don't think you can get sort of a contact high from smelling it. But you you want to be you want to be cautious around these different things, especially a meth lab. That would be a it would really be almost an unsafe scene. Let fire department go in there, police go in there, get the drug guggies out, and then fire department go in there and make sure it's safe to even be there. Uh, and then this is a chapter. We'll, we'll run over that fairly quick uh, later. Weapons of mass destruction, nuclear devices. Uh, all these would essentially constitute a mass, mass casualty incident or an MCI. And by definition, an MCI is where you have a number of patients that will overwhelm the system, okay? Uh, my largest number so far with patients has been 20. But we didn't declare an MCI because it didn't overwhelm our system. We landed, I think, four helicopters on Interstate 30 to take some of them away. They were all critically injured. They were all ejected from a, a van. There's 20 of them in a 15 passenger van. They were thrown all over Interstate 30 for a good distance. You know, we talked the other day about the length of your uh, scene. This was a lengthy scene. People were thrown down the interstate. Uh, bilateral femur fractures the whole nine yards. Okay, so they were critical patients, but it didn't overwhelm us because we had enough resources at the time. Okay. These will probably overwhelm. A little dirty bomb goes off or something, depending on the bomb itself, it can cause a lot of, lot of injuries. Okay, uh, biological agents. If you knew about all the biological agents that we have in the United States, us, the good guys, right? You wouldn't sleep at night, knowing what's out there. And they are nasty. They nasty. Some of them deal with blood. You'd start bleeding from every orifice in your body in contact with this. And a mask does nothing. The filters, like on a gas mask, they just eat right through the filters. There's nothing you can do except die. Okay. Uh, so they're 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 nasty. They are. They're very very bad. And then chemicals. You know, uh, chemical weapons. Deployment is just as bad. The, the, I think, personally, here, death was fast, unless you're just on the outskirts of a nuclear device that's been set off. If you're on the, in, in the kill zone, you, you're going to die pretty quick. If you're on the outskirts, then you, you, uh, you'll probably die of radiation poisoning, which is like having cancer, okay? I'd almost rather be on the inside real quick, personally speaking, okay? Biological agents, you're going to die slow-suffering death. I mean, 
mean, there's, there's just nothing they can do. You, uh, the, I say the patients, right? Patients are going to bleed to death right in front of you. There's just nothing you can do. They'll start bleeding out of every orifice. Okay. And can, then who knows about chemicals? It could, it could burn, burn the patient. It could cause respiratory uh, arrest. Who, who knows, right? So uh, that's that. When we talk about weapons of mass destruction, we want to keep our borders safe. We really do. Okay, because uh, there's people out there that want to harm Americans. So we want to make sure that these guys don't get in with these type of weapons. And according to what I hear, they stop them every day. There's an on, ongoing thing about them trying to get into the United States, terrorists. So they, uh, it's, a, it's a battle. But we would treat these as an MCI, typically. All right. All right. Questions over that? Quick, pretty quick. Make sure you read through it. Definitions, right? Vocabulary. Uh, it's it's really important to know. But in that chapter, there wasn't so much. Yeah. It's, it was just the heart zone, safety zone, one zone, and closing. Yeah, there's, there's not much to it. 